Hey, what's going on there? Pete Moriarty here. Thank you so much for joining. If you are on the live, if you are watching the repeat, drop me down a hashtag repeat. But if you're on the live, please say hello. Uh, drop into the comments, into the live chat here and let me know where you're watching from. Always great to have people from all over the world joining our streams now, which is uh, pretty dope. And uh, yeah, if you are one of the people watching with me live, uh, then you're probably one of the people who are most closely connected to us. Uh, we, we don't get crazy amounts of people on these lives, but they are growing and growing and growing. So very glad to have you here as a dedicated watcher. Uh, maybe this is the first time you've watched uh, one of my lives. Uh, maybe you've been following the channel for a bit. Uh, would love to know. Uh, I often receive messages uh, from uh, from uh, people who are following the channel on Instagram. You can connect with me. Just jump on any one of the links below the videos. And uh, yeah, and many people say they've been watching the channel for some time uh, and they really enjoy my content and my videos. So great to have you here. Um, there is actually also a, a second channel that I am launching very soon. If you want to be the first to get access to that, uh, then just head along to my surname, moriarty.live. I'm just going to drop that um, drop that link in there. Uh, if you're interested in uh, more on the business psychology side of entrepreneurship, uh, IT Genius is obviously our tech and business channel, um, and we cover a lot of like tech leadership, systemization, and getting your business sorted. Uh, but on my personal channel, I'm going to be covering more on um, you know my my passion of psychology and entrepreneurship and business and where they intersect. Uh, so a little bit less on the tech side of things, a little bit more on the leadership and people side of things. So if you're interested in that, head along to that link there, Moriarty.live, uh, and uh, and that should link you to my new channel, which is being launched. So there's a couple of videos on there right now, uh, but we're going to be publishing quite a lot more uh, because I've actually launched a mentorship. So I've launched a performance mentorship for business owners. It's called On Track. So if you're an established entrepreneur, you've got a, a business that is launched, uh, scaling up. If you're doing more than $100,000 a year in revenue, that's the absolute minimum for me to accept anyone. Ideally, you've got a team that you're building up. Um, well, uh, then if you're interested in that, you can check out the links to that on my Instagram. It's currently on waitlist uh, because it filled up pretty quickly. I just put up a story and I had like 40 people message me, which was pretty crazy. Um, but there will be spots opening up for that at some point in the future. Well, uh, without further ado, let's get into today's show. I'm going to be covering as many of your questions as I can possibly do uh, in the next little while. Uh, so I've got a couple of hours put aside. I'm going to do absolutely all I can to answer as many questions as possible. And if you're on the live, you can also submit your questions live. So you can just drop them straight into the comments here uh, in the live chat. And I'm going to be monitoring that live chat as well as I can. Uh, again, if you're joining on the live stream, I would love to know where you're watching from. Uh, maybe drop in a link to your business as well. Um, uh, Gustavos has, is the first person who's jumped in and said hello uh, uh, in Just Learning from California. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, if you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an employee working for someone else's business, uh, maybe you're a manager, maybe you're a leader, um, maybe you're someone who's just interested in the Google ecosystem and you want to learn more, uh, well, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and uh, look forward to supporting you through your Google journey. Uh, so we're uh, here to help small business owners. Uh, I'm deeply, deeply passionate about helping entrepreneurs get more done and helping business owners systemize, organize, and scale using Google Workspace. And we not only work with Google Workspace, but we work with a suite of best practice technology tools, including uh, Asana for task management, including uh, tools like Hiver for shared inbox management, including tools like Zapier, uh, which helps you connect all of your cloud apps together. Um, we're here for tools like Copper CRM, uh, which is a relational-based CRM system, uh, which helps you to manage the relationships with your customers, and it uses a bunch of AI to automatically pull in your data and automatically have that data displayed to your team in meaningful ways. Um, and all of these tools make up a suite of best practice small business tools so that you can run better businesses. And uh, I was speaking with one of my uh, mentees this morning, who's a part of my OnTrack program. And uh, she was sharing with me that she has lots of different people in different locations. Uh, and across those different locations, uh, she runs childcare centers. Um, across those different locations, um, sometimes people are a little bit less tech savvy. Uh, and so if you have staff who are a little bit less tech savvy, they're maybe new to technology or maybe they're a little bit of an older demographic. And so they didn't grow up with tech like us millennials did. Um, you know, there is an additional layer of management required there uh, to help people learn and adopt the technology that you're using in your business. And so my philosophy is always as much as possible to keep the technology nice and simple. You want to make sure that you have simple systems that are repeatable for your team. 
And the, the way that I think about this is simple systems, but strong enforcement. So simple tech systems, simple ways of doing things, simple processes in the business, uh, but strong enforcement of your policies and strong enforcement of the way that you do things. Because if you're interested in growing a scalable business, a business that can work without you and a business that can give you the lifestyle and the freedom that you want and the income that you want without you feeling like a slave or completely owned by your business, uh, well, you want to make sure you have great systems so that you can actually step back. And you need people to work and run those systems. If they're too complex, people aren't going to be able to do it or they're not going to be engaged in it either. Um, so uh, that's the really the best way that you can connect uh, with your team and ensure that uh, you're actually uh, helping them to connect and actually uh, adopt the systems that you're putting in place is to keep things simple. Speaking of scaling and speaking of keeping things simple, uh, we've built what we call the Growth Roadmap for Businesses. And uh, if you haven't already checked this out on our channel, head along to our channel. There's a playlist for each one of these stages of business. Uh, but basically, based on the size of business that you're at, you're going to have different technology challenges in scaling up your business. You can see here on the left-hand side, uh, launch businesses, someone who's just getting started is going to need the absolute basics done, like you know your password security, uh, making sure that you actually have your files backed up, making sure you've got your workspace account cor configured correctly so that emails are flowing and your emails don't go to spam. Uh, but then as you go to a startup, business, uh, really, as you're starting to replicate yourself as an entrepreneur, most important things you're going to be working on there are task management and then file structures. So like permissions and your files and setting up your shared drives correctly, making sure you've got good task management and project delivery inside your business. Um, and then for a growth business, you're really starting to hit your strides and, and turn it into a real company. Uh, from there, you want to look at relationship management with a CRM system. Uh, we've got customer service delivery. We've got a cloud-based phone system. And you want to be starting to build in analytics, automations, and uh, everything else in your business that is going to make your life easier so you're not having to work with manual systems um, and so on and so forth. This growth roadmap takes you through the different stages of business and what technology is most important for you to implement at each stage. Because it's very hard to keep track of all the tech tools required to run a business, right? There's tens of thousands of tools out there and people can get caught up in bright, shining object syndrome, especially if you're an entrepreneur. And so if you're the kind of person who jumps between different systems and different apps, you may end up signing up for too many, or you may just be completely overwhelmed with the choices that are available right now. That growth roadmap has been designed to take away the mystery of the different stages of business and where you should be focusing on with your technology strategy. So head to our YouTube channel, click on the playlist tab, go and check out the growth roadmap if you haven't already, and there are playlists for whatever stage of business that you're at, which will help you along the way. Okay, so let's get into some of your questions. I've got lots of questions lined up and I'm gonna get through as many of these as possible uh, in the next couple of hours. Let's uh, see how we go, see how my energy goes. Uh, and we do have we do have lots of people on the stream. I can see how many people are on the stream right now. So I know there's a lot of people who haven't said hello yet. Please make sure you say hello. Uh, drop me a little message, even if it's just a hi, uh, please say hello in the chat. Uh, so I know that there are, some, there are some real humans out there that I can actually talk to. Uh, it keeps it much more engaging and entertaining for me. So Graham asked a question uh, about groups. Uh, we use an all staff group for the team messages uh, and also connect with them by email. Are there any guidelines on when you would use chat and when you would use email for internal communications? Well, that's a great question, Graham. And I'm actually gonna suggest to you that you don't ever use email for internal communications. Chat is useful and we'll talk about that, but I don't recommend using email for internal communications. The reason for that is that uh, email is quite a kind of formal communication method, right? When we're writing an email to someone, we need to say, dear so-and-so, here is my email and I have a request for you, kind regards, hope you're well, signature. And that's a bit weird to send to a colleague who you probably have a pretty close and casual personal relationship with when they're sitting right next to you or even if you've got a geographically distributed team, they're on the same team as you, no matter where they are location-wise. And so my recommendation for that reason is that you don't uh, you don't actually bother with a, uh, a, a internal email for that kind of communication. Any internal communication that happens inside your business should either be in chat, which has some challenges, or should be in some other project management or task management or workflow system. Now, there's heaps of options out there. It might be Asana, it might be monday.com, it might be Trello, it might be Notion. There's lots of different apps. Ideally, you wanna choose one that has an like a kind of communication log uh, assigned to tasks. And so let's say you have project X, I'm building a building, maybe I'm constructing a house, um, and you know, within that, there will be a feed of updates and comments from people who are working on that project. 
Um, and so we happen to use Asana for that inside our business. Now, that's one reason. It's less formal communication, so it's easier to, to rapidly communicate with your team if you're not using email. Second is the distraction factor. If your team are expected to be in their email or checking their email for any internal communications within your business, then they're gonna be stuck in their email inboxes all day. And because they want to be uh, 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 you know, um, expedient and productive team members, uh, in their minds, they probably think, well, if I keep my email open all day, then that'll keep the boss happy, right? And so what ends up happening is they're going to potentially be distracted by external customer emails all day long while they're waiting to see the emails that you might potentially send them. So that's also not great for productivity either. They're probably gonna have alerts configured so their new emails pop up on their desktops because they don't wanna miss an email for you. Uh -uh, that's a big issue because that means that people get stuck in their email all day long. They, they can, can't do any deep work uh, and effectively they get stuck in this interruption factory of constantly getting pinged by emails. So my best practice is this. You use chat only when it's urgent. Chat is the equivalent of walking up to somebody's cubicle, knocking on the door and saying, hey, are you busy right now? And you wouldn't do that to your colleagues in the office all day long about every issue. So be very sparing about how you're using chat inside the business uh, because that's the kind of thing that people probably will have an audible alert or maybe even a pop-up alert. Uh, and I have made other videos about how you can manage your notifications to make them a little more um, uh, you know, usable so they're not uh, completely overwhelming. Um, but with your chat, you want to use that as sparingly as possible. But you want to have a second system inside the business, and that second system should be your task and project management system, which ideally has space for non-urgent communications. So communications that are related to a task or related to a project, uh, but are non-urgent, because chat is going to interrupt, um, but your task management system will not immediately interrupt people. And then ban email, ban internal email. You can still use email for customers, but ban internal email. Now, sometimes people will ask, well, you know, Pete, if, if we're telling everyone to turn off their email inside the business, what about emails from customers? And to that, I would say some of your roles inside the business may be responsible for being responsive to customers very quickly. If you run a help desk or a customer service type um, uh, role of some sort, you're probably going to have people in your business that are dedicated to being in their email all day long. That's fine, but that's only certain people within the business. It shouldn't be the whole company. Hopefully that's answered your question and that was useful. Okay, we've got a couple of people who have finally said hi on the stream. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, Anesity, welcome. Uh, Michael, hey, mate, uh, welcome. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, okay, cool. I will uh, come back to, uh, I'll come back to your question as well. I'm going to go ahead and just pin that so I can come back to it. All right, just checking my stream and any messages from my team here. I think we're all looking okay. Wonderful. Uh, last time I was on stream, I accidentally clicked the wrong button on my iPad and um, on my on my streaming desk. Sorry, and uh, and I ended up playing music for the first five minutes of the stream, which was not very good. Um, okay, wonderful. So I will come back. Actually, let's let's uh, tackle a couple of these questions right now. So I've got a question here from Anicity. Do you think Google will build uh, new co uh, new communities like platform uh, to have a SharePoint type of solution? Um, and I assume that means, oh, oh and uh, and they've clarified here, Google Currents. So another another platform like Google Currents, a bit more like um, a bit more like SharePoint. You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if Google have anything in the works about that because we're not told about those things. What I do know with Google is that unfortunately they're pretty ruthless at killing off products that don't reach a certain level of user adoption. Uh, and unfortunately, Google Currents, and before that, there was Google Wave. Uh, there have been many solutions or proposed solutions over the years for, <clears throat> for team collaboration in, in different ways. I think what Google seem to be focusing on right now is having uh, Google Spaces, which includes tasks now. It includes chat. You can attach files. Uh, and I, I suspect that is their primary place where they're expecting teams to collaborate. It's really great for chat. Um, obviously, you don't want to use it all day long. Uh, it's not my recommendation. My recommendation is to use a different app for your task and your project management. Um, but in terms of like instant messaging and keeping connected with the team, even with, when you're remote, uh, Google Chat is pretty great for that. I don't have anything in the, else in the works. I'm sure they will continue to try things. Um, they do have a number of different research and development areas inside the business, and they are continuing to try things. And because of competitor pressure with tools like Slack, with tools like uh, Microsoft Teams, 
Uh, Microsoft SharePoint is obviously part of the Microsoft portfolio. Google will need to continue to create tools for teams to get work done. We've had probably 10 years of progress in remote work and flexible hybrid work teams over the two years of the pandemic since COVID began. And that has basically put these tech companies on a little bit of a back foot with the technology. But what it does mean is that everyone is now doubling down on creating solutions for teams to work together no matter where they are from. Now, we were doing this six years before the pandemic happened. And so we'd kind of like ironed out the kinks and worked out enough things to get right. So our team, which is now 50, 60 odd people are able to work remotely, uh, but it did take some time to get there. And so I expect that you'll, you'll continue to see more collaboration tools tested out from uh, large vendors like Microsoft, like, like Google. Can't say exactly what it's gonna look like in the future, uh, but we will see. Uh, and little follow-up message here. They've done a good job this year with new features. And yes, although they were very slow. Um, if you remember in the uh, pandemic, Everyone just went to Zoom. Uh, Google Hangouts wasn't there yet. They didn't have the ability to record online. They didn't have the ability to do breakout rooms or Q&A or anything like that. Uh, and Google for nine months were really on the back foot um, when it came to doing video meetings for the pandemic. Finally, they caught up, but they really, they really missed it. And uh, Zoom became the darling of the pandemic, uh, which is a bit of a bummer for Google. But, you know, that's, that's Google. Sometimes they're a bit slow to, uh, to build things out. Okay, we have another question here from uh, Gustavos. Is there a business email company to use, uh, Gmail Business? Uh, yes, my recommendation uh, my recommendation would be that you work with IT Genius, our company right here. Uh, uh, there it is. Uh, we help business owners if you're a, from sole operators or you know startup mode, uh, right up to large organizations with hundreds or even thousands of employees. Uh, we are experts at helping you get set up on Google Workspace, getting it all configured for you, making sure your DNS settings are correct, making sure you roll it out to your team correctly, making sure all of your um, uh, you know admin settings are, are correct in there, uh, making sure that you uh, set the right permissions so you don't accidentally you know share files with the wrong people. All those things we take care of for you, uh, and it's all very very affordable and designed for small and micro businesses under our concierge program. And if you're already set up on Workspace, you can actually join concierge for free. Um, and so head along to our website, there's an offer to transfer your billing into us and you get a, a free concierge subscription. It's a very basic plan, uh, but you do get access to that. Wonderful, okay. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Camstad1ZL. Uh, what are the best workplace security tips for SMEs? And uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I'll give you a few off the, off the top of my head now. Number one for small businesses to implement is a two-factor authentication policy. Make sure you switch that on. Two-factor authentication is enabled on many accounts when you log into Google for the first time, but for most businesses that we work with, it's not enabled as a policy inside of Google Workspace. So you may have some staff that have not set up a second factor of authentication. So you can do that by going to the admin panel. Uh, inside the admin panel, you can actually enforce two-factor authentication as a policy under the security menu. Uh, you can also ensure there uh, that your team have strong passwords and there's a number of other security features included in there as well. Most breaches occur when someone has given open access to their account by basically leaving the back door open if you've only got it protected with an email address and a password. We're all guilty of reusing passwords unless you've rolled out something like LastPass. And for many people, the password they use for their email is something memorable, so therefore you're gonna use it for other websites as well. And so what happens is if one other website that you have used becomes compromised, someone gets access to your email address and your password combination, boom, they're into your account. And if you're a business owner, that means they have access to your whole business. And so setting that is absolutely number one and making sure that it's a policy enforced right across your whole company. So to do that, you go to your admin panel, admin.google.com, you go to security settings and implement a forced two-factor authentication policy. Now, what we've also seen in the last few years, unfortunately, is many people are actually having mobile phone numbers hijacked. If someone somehow gets access to your identity, and there've been many high profile cases of security breaches in organizations that have leaked the personal identity of consumers, especially here in Australia, we've had a number in the last couple of months. Once someone has your identity, they can actually call your phone provider, pretend to be you, and actually switch your number, switch your phone number to a new SIM card. And all they need to do then is use your password and email combination to get into your account and have a text message sent to your phone. And so be very, very careful 
with how you configure your two-factor authentication. It is ideal that you use an app instead of a text message response. And with that app, you could also use a security key. There are USB keys available that you can plug in as well. If you do that one thing correctly, just do that one thing. This is the one thing, promise me, if you do one thing for your small business security, that's the most important thing that you can do. Uh, and it's gonna save you a lot of headache and trouble with compromised accounts. All right, wonderful. Uh, great, let's move on to our next question. So Albert asks, uh, what do you think about Google Workspace Individual? Uh, now comes with one terabyte of storage, and I think that will be interesting for me for personal use. Uh, I agree. I think uh, it is very interesting for personal use. Uh, personally, I've been using a Google Workspace account, a Google Workspace business account for personal use for uh, many, many, many years. And I've created other videos about that on our channel. So if you search our channel for, uh, I think, probably G Suite personal use, uh, you'll find a video there on uh, why you should use it and why I recommend it. Now, that option there, um, that option there to use a Workspace account for personal use basically grants you access to Google's business tools for maybe your family domain name or just an individual domain name. And the advantage that I really like about that is it lets me get access to uh, additional features like Google Shared Drives. Uh, they're only available on business accounts. They're not available on consumer Gmail accounts. And so using Shared Drives means that if I want to, let's say, um, get some GoPro footage from a car cruise or from riding my motorbike with my friends, I can have them submit that footage into a folder for me uh, and I won't actually um, uh, have any chance of losing that data because I can set the permission where they're a contributor to the shared drive. They can place files in the shared drive, but they can't remove files from the shared drive. Uh, so that's a great way of collecting data. I use that uh, in, my, in my personal life quite a lot. Uh, the second reason is uh, you get backup options uh, and so I can use our business backup tools to automatically back up any of the data that's sitting in my Google Drive and my team manage that for me under our concierge program. If you're a member of concierge, we give you a few uh, free backup licenses to back up your accounts. Uh, but thirdly is security and availability of the account. If you lose access to your Gmail account by someone hacking into it or you forget the password or maybe Google shuts it down because they think that you're spamming or you know something goes wrong inside the account or for whatever reason they just switch off the account, it's very, very, very difficult to get back into that account because Google have literally 2 billion Gmail accounts that they are supporting, and they don't really provide much end user support for those accounts. But if you have a business account and you have it billed through IT Genius, well, we actually have, as a reseller, a backdoor to your account. And so if you forget your admin password or it gets compromised, or even if Google suspends the account, we actually have a backdoor to get back into the account as a administrator. It doesn't cost you anything extra, uh, and you can actually get access to all of your account uh, and maintain that access. Now, for me, for all of my personal family photos, for all of my memories, for all of my GoPro and other travel footage, for absolutely everything in my life, I'd prefer to know that I can get access to that if there is an emergency and for some reason I lose access to my account. That's about where the advantages finish. The disadvantages of using a workspace account for personal use are that you unfortunately have some issues with, uh, you know, you can't use Nest Home uh, for your home automation. Uh, some of the features of uh, Google Home don't work. So if you've got like Google Wi-Fi points and Google Assistant and those kind of things, uh, they have some limitations. It still works, but there are limitations. Um, and so there's some of the trade-offs that you have. And um, even silly things like I can't share my movies that I've purchased on Google Play Movies with anybody else in my family, even if they're users inside my Google Workspace account. Uh, basically, Google treats it as a business account and a lot of the consumer services are just not compatible. Here in Australia, I still can't get Google Assistant to tell me what my calendar events are for the day on a Workspace account. Apparently, it was released years ago, but I think there's a bug of some sort in my account and Google don't support any consumer services on your business account. So they're the downsides, there are trade-offs either way, and I made a, uh, a, a reaction video to that recently, um, you know, sharing some of the bugs and some of the issues that I've had. Uh, so check that out on the channel if you wanna learn a little bit more about that. Uh, but thank you very much for the question. Okay, uh, we have a question here. We have a question here from Gustavos. When I get a domain name, uh, where and how do you store it? Uh, do you just write it down or, uh, or where do you store it? So if you register a domain name, you're gonna register that, register that through a registrar. Um, and so it might be someone like GoDaddy or my personal favorite is Cloudflare. 
Uh, and Cloudflare uh, not only lets you register a domain name, but also hosts your DNS. And DNS is where you put all of the settings uh, for your domain name, like where does my website go? Where do my emails go? And it gets a bit technical to set up that kind of thing, uh, which is why we have our concierge service to help you out with any of the implementation of the technical features of setting up Google Workspace. If you're interested in that, there'll be a link right down below this. Uh, you can click through and check out concierge. Or if you'd like to check out our quick fix service, um, if you want to have like a DNS checkup or you need just one thing fixed and you're not ready to commit to joining a concierge plan, uh, we also have a quick fix service on the website that's also available via that link below. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay, let's move on to our next question. The Meteor Freak asks, so you manage uh, the groups with each having their own email. Does that mean you need to create and pay $12 for each new group email that you create? Um, and so we use groups for our uh, we use groups for our uh, permissions inside our account. I'm going to show you what that looks like inside my admin account. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and log into my admin account here. And remember, your admin account is at admin.google.com. Uh, but here inside my admin account, we actually create user groups for our permissions. And so I'm going to open up my groups here. Uh, and you can see we've got lots of different groups. So for each area of the business, we'll have a group and we use these for permissions. Now, if you'd like to learn about how to actually implement group-based permissions inside your business, there's a great training video on our channel called Getting Your Google Drive Permissions Right. And if you search for that video, uh, then you will be able to go. There's a full training, 30 minutes, right from start to finish on setting up group-based permissions and how you can apply that to shared calendars, shared folders in Google Drive, um, everything you need to know is right inside that training video. Now, the question here is, is that actually going to cost? Uh, is that actually going to cost an extra license for each group? And the answer is no, uh, you do not get charged for your groups. So when you uh, are actually uh, setting up a new group, effectively, they are like an alias in that you don't actually have to pay for any of them. Uh, you only have to pay inside your Google Workspace account for the buckets of email that you use. So peter at itgenius.com is a bucket of email. Bob at itgenius.com is a bucket of email. You only pay each license for a bucket of email, but if you have a group and let's say it's administrators at itgenius.com and that's just a group of people in there, um, even if it has its own email address, all that happens is, uh, let me show you, it's probably easy to show you guys visually. Let me open it up here. Open up my little, uh, little jam board, which is one of my favorite tools here. Okay, so we're gonna have one bucket of email here for uh, Peter. And we're gonna have one bucket of email here for Bob. And these are both at IT Genius. There we go. Now, let's say we create a, uh, let's say we create an, uh, a group and we call it admins. admins at your company. Uh, now, if that is just a group, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take each email that comes into your business and it's just gonna pop it in those buckets. It's called a distribution group. But you can also use that for, uh, for um, uh, permissions as well. So effectively what we have here, it's kind of like a virtual email address uh, or an alias, uh, but the actual buckets of email are the only things that we're going to be charged for. And, you know, depending on your location, it's going to be five bucks or eight or 12 or whatever, however many dollars it is, uh, that's what you actually get charged for. But great question. Thanks very much for uh, answer, uh, asking, sorry. Thanks very much for asking that question. I am nothing asks. The only thing I hate about Google is that even though I selected a stream, still mirrors my files offline. Uh, I only want one folder to automatically download on my PC, and then uh, the you know computer option is great for that. Uh, but I'm seeing all the files in my Drive app uh, in my offline hard drive. I don't want any of these other files to be in my hard drive. So um, there's two things to kind of cover here. Google obviously have a pretty amazing feature built into Google Drive, which is called it used to be called Google Drive File Stream. Uh, it's now just basically called Google Drive. Uh, and what that does is it allows you to basically see all of the files inside your Google Drive from your local computer. Now, I'm gonna show you this on a Chrome box, uh, which is um, probably gonna be a little bit different to what you're used to seeing. Uh, let me see if I can switch off the dark theme here so you can see a bit better. So this is probably a little bit used to different to what you're used to seeing on a Windows machine or on a Mac, uh, and that's, that's okay. Um, but you can see here, when I go to my Google Drive, if I click on my My Drive, I can see all the files and folders 
in my my drive when i click on my shared drives i can see all of my shared drives and let's open up my marketing shared drive i can see all the files and folders from my marketing shared drive now the thing is that these don't all exist on my computer these live on the cloud and when i just click a file uh that's going to just open that file itself so i'm going to double click on this pdf here it's going to download it in the background it does it very quickly because i've got a, a pretty quick internet connection although this one's now taking its time <laughs> there we go uh cool so it downloads that um and then i've got the uh then i've got the file there right so that makes things super easy for me when i'm working on my computer because if i'm on a laptop uh, you know, I don't want to fill up that hard drive with everything that's sitting on my Google Drive online. Uh, and so what this allows me to do is see everything, uh, but not have to download everything. Now, um, the person who has asked this question has said, hey, I don't want it to work like that. Um, unfortunately, there is no other option. You're, you're kind of stuck with it. Uh, it's going to show you all the files, even though it's not going to download all of the files. But if you want things to look a little bit differently, then perhaps you could make use of some more shared drives instead. Um, and so when you set up a shared drive inside of, inside of Google Drive, and I'll show you what that looks like here. When we set up a shared drive instead of in, inside Google Drive, uh, we can have different collections of data inside our shared drives. And so this is, my, uh, this is my attract drive here, which is our marketing drive. So I put all my marketing stuff in there. Uh, if I go back to my... Oh, it's running a little bit slowly there. Let's go back to my shared drives here. I can maybe go into my finance drive. That's going to show me all of my uh, financial documents there. And so here we've basically got everything organized nicely into these shared drives. And I would suggest if you're seeing things on your desktop that you don't really want to see, then uh, maybe make a little bit more intelligent use of shared drives so that when you go to open the files, that is sitting on your local computer from your file browser. That's either going to be, um, you know, the Explorer app on a Windows machine, or it's going to be Finder on a Mac. Uh, then you're going to see just the shared drives, and you know, maybe there's just one that you want to have your uh, your actual documents downloaded to. Anyway, I hope that helps. All right, I'm going to see if there's any more questions that have come through in the last few moments. Uh, no, none yet. Wonderful. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So Luv asks, can they see my Google Photos if I upload it to my organization's account? Great question. I get these questions every single week on the channel. Can administrators see what I'm doing inside my business account? Can administrators see what I'm doing inside the Google account? Can the administrator read my emails? Uh, can the administrator see my photos? Can the administrator see anything that I've uploaded into Google Drive? And I would say, if you are using a business account, if you're an employee and someone else is managing the Google Workspace account that you're using, expect that someone can access every single piece of data that is in there, including your history, including your bookmarks, including every website that you visited, including your searches, including your chats, including to people outside the business, including every one of your emails, including anything that you put in Google Photos. Anything under that business account is going to be accessible by administrators simply because of the fact that they have the ability to reset your password. If you are terminated from the organization that you're working at, someone can suspend that account, reset the password, and then log in as if they were you. They can even reset your two-factor authentication devices and get straight into the account. That's literally the power that an administrator needs to manage a Google Workspace account. So yes, 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 yes. An administrator can see absolutely everything inside your Google Workspace account uh, and so expect that that is the case. I don't know why you would consider uploading personal photos or personal information to a work account anyway. It seems a bit weird, um, but you definitely don't want to leave anything in there uh, that you don't want to have in the hands of the administrator of the Workspace account. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going there and reading in, you know, reading your emails. Um, I've been an IT administrator for a very long time and uh, helped many businesses out with their organizational IT, technology, infrastructure, start to finish, everything in the tech world I've helped businesses with. And as an IT administrator, I've got literally thousands of customers. We have tens of thousands of employees across those customers. We don't give a shoot about what files are in your account. No one cares to read your email. The IT guy does not care what you're doing in your account until there is a problem, until someone is a bad lever, uh, until there's a court case, until there's a customer who has an issue, that's when people will start looking and digging around. Um, so just, I guess, be mindful of that, um, that someone will access the account if they need to, but you don't have anything to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis because they're probably not going to be reading anything in there unless there's something they absolutely have to. Okay, uh, next up, 
Question from Nick. Uh, I want to ask how to set up conversation view to show the latest email on top. Now, unfortunately, Nick, uh, there is no way to do this inside of Gmail that I know about. It's possible there are third-party plugins or applications which will allow you to do this, uh, but I have personally not yet found a way to get this done. Conversation View is designed to read like a forum. It was actually uh, replicated off uh, news groups and forums uh, when Gmail was first created, and it is a little bit easier to kind of imagine Conversation View a little bit like commenting on Facebook. When you create a new comment, you're basically creating it down the bottom of the list on the tree of emails. Uh, and so each new response and newest response is going to arrive down the bottom. And so if you can conceptualize it and imagine it that way, even when you're you know, hitting reply and maybe you're just replying to one individual person rather than the whole group, or if you wanna to reply to the whole group again, it's a little bit like Facebook, you know, kind of replying to a sub comment or replying to the main set of comments or replying to the main post. So if you think about it that way, um, even with mentioning people now, you can use the at symbol uh, and just mention someone on email and it'll add them to the email thread, which is pretty cool. Um, Google have built that to flow in that way very, very particularly, and I've not found any way of having it work the other way. Try and wrap your head around that, and hopefully that helps. All right, uh, so next question here. Uh, Ragu has asked, uh, does Google Workspace apps work well on an Apple M2 MacBook? Great question. Google has been designed to run on the browser first, irrespective of operating system. Uh, and so as long as you have Google Chrome on your machine, whether that be a Mac or a PC, you're gonna get the absolute best experience for Google Workspace. However, Google also works pretty great in Safari and in Internet Explorer as well. A lot of the browsers have actually moved to use the uh, same underlying web engine anyway. Um, so uh, most things are pretty consistent now, even though there are different features on the outside of your web browsers and modern day web browsers. But if you want the absolute best experience, and particularly if you're a manager or an owner of a business and you want to ensure that everyone in your workspace has a consistent experience right across your organization, you wanna be using Google Chrome for that. Because when you sign into Google Chrome, you can actually create policies within Google Workspace and those policies will be pushed down to your organization. But back to your question, Raghu. Uh, what is going to be the best uh, you know, environment for actually using Google Workspace? Well, it doesn't really matter if you're using a Mac or if you're using a Windows computer. Interestingly enough, uh, all of Google's engineers or prim the primary, uh, primary bulk of Google's engineers actually use Macs to develop Google's operating system and to develop Google's online tools. Now, that's not to say that it works better on Macs, but what it is to say is that there's absolutely no issue with you using any device. Now, my information is, potentially up to 10 years old there. But what I heard was at the time when I heard it, if you were a Google engineer and you wanted to use a Windows computer because of the security concerns of the Windows operating system, not quite being as locked down as Apple uh, Mac OS, uh, you actually had to like put in a request to your manager to get access to a Windows machine other than the standard issued Macs. So take from that what you will, uh, but Google are very committed to things working great on the Mac. Uh, and I certainly know that many business owners that I've consulted to over the years have chosen to switch to Macs because they're simpler and they're reliable. And of course, they have that cool factor of being a Mac. Uh, and so I will leave that with you. Okay, uh, let's move on to our next question. Okay. Confirmation Bias Network, that's an interesting username. My Gmail address has been hacked. Uh, oh, that's not good at all. Um, someone has made my other emails a part of their workspace. Uh, they've turned my other emails into work. How do I get myself out of this? Um, I used to have an iPhone. The chats were redirected. They now completely control my phones and I can't go to the bank unless I go in person. Um, okay, that uh, certainly sounds like a challenging situation. Um, I would say this is a very, very good case to re-remind everyone to implement two-factor authentication uh, and implement a two-factor authentication policy inside your admin panel. Under the security settings of your admin panel, make sure you've implemented a two-factor authentication policy and enforced it for your whole team. The other thing I would recommend is that you no longer use mobile phones for your authentication. Don't use, sorry, don't use text messages for your authentication. You still wanna use a mobile phone, but you wanna use app-based authentication, or you wanna roll out a USB security key for your authentication. Now, hope is not yet lost. If you still own your domain name and you still have access to your domain name, you can get into the back end of a Google Workspace account 
fairly easily. Now, this is probably something that you want to rely on the help of our professional support team uh, to actually help you go through the process. Uh, but there is a way to effectively break into the back door of a Workspace account as long as you still have access to your domain name and your DNS settings. So if right now you're someone who is stuck because you've got your account hacked or lost or something like that and you need an account recovery, uh, you can take advantage of our quick fix with IT Genius. And that quick fix is basically our team helping you to use DNS to get back into your account. We can't guarantee that we'll get back in, uh, but we'll do our absolute best. If you're right now locked out of your Google account and you want some help, uh, then please chat to our team. There will be a link below to access a quick fix and they'll be very happy to help you out. All right, uh, great question. Okay, cool. So let me check. Uh, G'day, Graham. Oh, we covered your question earlier, Graham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for joining. Uh, you may have to catch that on the replay, uh, but I think your question was first if you want to go back and listen. Okay, uh, next question here is from Jamie. What is a good, simple software to document simple processes so you can see what you're building and the team can access it? Well, Jamie, you must be new around here because I've been recommending Google Sites to everyone on the channel over many, many, many years. Uh, and so Google Sites is a wonderful tool that allows you to build an intranet for your company uh, right inside the Google Workspace. Now, it's pretty basic, it's quite rudimentary, um, but here's what an intranet looks like inside Google Sites. Uh, you can see here that on the left-hand side, I've got a menu and we've got all the different areas of the business organized uh, in pages and sub-pages here. Uh, and some of the ones that I like to show off are our newbies guide, which is how we onboard our staff. So in their first week, we've got a whole bunch of tasks that they need to get done, training that they need to watch, uh, tools that they need to get access to. And you can see that that is all linked in one place called your first week. From there, we take newbies through things like our values, uh, we share with them uh, you know, what our company is about, some of the things that we get done together, what's important to us as a team. Um, and of course, here we have our company structure. So the team members have an idea of how our business works. We've got our mission and we've got our customers and lots of different uh, bits and pieces there to get new people up to speed. And then as an example, uh, you know, let's go and look at one of our uh, marketing processes here. We'll go to our brand Bible. Uh, this here has information on the kind of fonts and the kind of colors that we use, how we edit our video, and all of those kind of policies that if we onboard a new video editor, as an example, um, they'll be able to get up to speed really quickly uh, to get our, uh, you know, get anything that they're producing on brand and on message with what we create inside our business. Um, and so we have nearly every single process documented in our business inside this intranet using Google Sites. It's available on the mobile. You can embed documents, you can embed forms if you wanna do some kind of workflowy type stuff. Um, but this is the place to store all your systems and processes. And if you've read a book like The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, which is a very, very popular book on systemizing and helping entrepreneurs to exit the day-to-day -day of their business, uh, you would know that Michael Gerber talks about a standard operating procedures manual. Well, that's all that we've created here. This is a virtual edition of your standard operating procedures manual, uh, and it's a really great resource for your team to make sure that they can learn how you do things inside your business and keep up to date with the latest processes as well. Google Sites also gives you the ability to delegate different levels of permission. So perhaps you only want your managers to edit the site, uh, but th then you want to share, you know, read and viewing access to everyone inside the business. Uh, maybe you want to create a dedicated site just for contractors, which doesn't have all of your information across the whole company, but has specifically just a contractor training guide. Uh, well, you might create a second Google site for that and just share it with uh, your contractors. Now, when we're talking about sharing, how are we going to share it? Well, we're going to use group-based permissions, right? So we want to use group-based permissions for all of our internal sharing inside the business. Uh, and we've got a uh, training on that, check out the channel, check out the video called How to Get Your Google Drive Permissions Right. It's a 30 minute training on group based permissions and rolling them out across the company, which will then apply to Google Sites as well. But I'd love to know how you go. And for anyone who's on the live stream right now, I'd love to know how are you going right now systemizing your business? Are you getting your systems documented? Are you getting things delegated? Uh, I'd love to know in the comments, drop me a little chat here and uh, I'd love to know how your business systemization journey is going. Because that's really the way to freedom for entrepreneurs is systemizing and then delegating. And it's just this, this pattern of going back and forth, systemize, delegate, systemize, delegate, systemize, delegate, systemize, delegate. And you, the business owner, is just kind of like taking the hats off one by one by one, 
removing every hat from your business. Now, the advantage of having a uh, organizational chart kind of written up like this and documented is that at the start of your business, your face is probably going to be on every single one of those uh, those little squares there, right? Because you're doing absolutely everything. But as you grow, it's kind of like exercising a muscle. That delegation muscle is just going to be repeated over and over and over and over and over again. So that bit by bit, you're not doing anything else in the business anymore. And then you can retire to the beach and do whatever you want, which is you know very, very proudly where I ended up at 27 after systemizing my business and being able to exit. And then after a number of years of taking it very easy and traveling and, and you know enjoying the indulgence of early retirement, I've now been able to switch back to more purpose-driven work where I just do the things that I really love doing, one of those being presenting online. Uh, and I don't have to do anything, any of the things that I don't like doing, but I still have a successful business which pays me well, creates jobs for people, and has impact for our customers as well, which to me, that's utopia. Uh, and I want to help more business owners get there. So thanks for watching if, uh, if you're on board for that. Cool. So next up. Our next question is from Heightened Creative, and that is, can you bill your users and subscriptions for different companies on different cards? And I presume this person is talking about having multiple uh, subdomains within one Google Workspace account uh, and trying to bill them separately. Um, I want to have a separate subscription. Da da da. Uh, chat have said there's no way to do that. Uh, unfortunately, each Google Workspace account can only have one billing account. And so if you are running multiple businesses, multiple brands, multiple domains, multiple business operations under one workspace account, you can only bill it for one workspace account. However, if you work with a partner, there may actually be a way to do that differently. Now, you would need to be a significant sized business. Uh, we have some franchisees that are on board with us that have hundreds of employees, but they're kind of like, lots of different small businesses because they're a franchise and you know they might have hundreds or thousands of accounts in their workspace account, but it's spread across multiple businesses, 20, 30, 50, 100 businesses. In some cases, if you meet the criteria, uh, we will actually bill those individual business units separately. Um, uh, but I'm assuming if you're on this call, you're a small business and you may not qualify for that. But if you are interested, please reach out to our team We'll do our absolute best to help you with that if there is a possibility. Depending on the number of users that you have, if you meet the right thresholds, uh, we can potentially bill you separately for your accounts um, and make your life a little bit easier there. Good question. All right, cool. Uh, next question is from TRO Cycling asks, a group suggested for customers as well as internal staff. I have a folder with documents that I'd like to share with all of them? That is a great question. Uh, I would say the short answer to that is yes, uh, you can absolutely use groups for external users. I would try not to mix internal and external users in certain groups. I'd be very clear when a group is for external users and you can adjust the permissions uh, for that accordingly. But the most appropriate group that you might create for someone who's outside your business, maybe using a Gmail account or, um, you know, or another non-related Google Workspace account would be contractors to your business. So quite often we have a situation where one of our small business customers is maybe a trade services business or they're a training company and they have contractors coming in uh, and they don't want to expose all of their company information to the contractors. Um, and so in that case, you can set up a contractor's group inside your admin panel and add any of the email addresses that you need to into that contractor's group. And then inside that, contractors group, you just share access to the group for anything that they need to access, whether that's a shared drive, a calendar, maybe even a calendar invitation. Uh, you can use groups for all of that. And I'll show an example of what that uh, actually looks like. So here I actually have uh, inside my, uh, uh, inside, let me try and open up the right calendar here for you. Here inside my calendar, um, you can see here that I've got a number of events. Uh, and these are my mentoring calls. Now, each person who's in these calls is actually outside my business uh, because they're my mentees in my program. Um, and you can see here that I have a group. I'm not gonna expand that group because I don't want to um, expose anyone's um, personal information um, by doing that. But I have the 21 members there uh, that are currently active inside the mentorship uh, inside that group. And that one group basically has a whole bunch of external email addresses. Now. One of the great things about using groups for calendar events is that anytime you invite a group to a calendar event and it's a recurring event, if somebody new joins the group, 
they'll get an invitation to any recurring events that are happening and any future events that are happening. So you only need to set up the recurring event once uh, you invite the group and then anyone new that you add to the group is going to automatically get all of the invitations that they need to any standing meetings that you have that are repeating. Very, very, very cool feature. Uh, it also means that you don't have to bother with manually adding people to groups one by one. Um, you can just add, so manually adding people to events one by one or to file sharing one by one or to the Google site one by one. You just add them to the group once and then they get access to everything. So groups are a big yes from me on uh, using them to share, uh, on using them to share with anyone external to your company. I'd love to know in the comments, uh, let me know what you've used groups for. If you've used it for like sporting teams, if you've used it for, um, you know, sharing with contractors or someone that you're training. Uh, and if there's any more questions on groups, I'll be happy to take them. All right. Uh, I'm getting some, little, uh, getting some little bumps here on my chat. I'm just going to double check that all is good. Yep, all is good. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Uh, DJ asks, what do I recommend for a Google compatible business phone solution? Great question. Uh, we happen to be a global partner for Dialpad. Uh, we were the first ones to bring Dialpad to Australia, I think probably six or seven -ish years ago now. Uh, and Dialpad is uh, sold through us at IT Genius. If you're interested in it, we'd really love for you to consider buying the licenses through us. Doesn't cost you anything uh, extra. In fact, you may even get a discount. So we can help you set up a trial, evaluate the product. We'll hold your hands through that. You don't have to pay us any consulting or for any support. We'll just issue the licenses if you want to go off to the races and implement it yourself. Um, but that is an amazing app that connects you to your business and connects you to Google Workspace. Now, I'm going to open up Dialpad on my computer here and give you a, a quick rundown on what actually happens inside Dialpad um, because it's a pretty darn awesome piece of technology. Now, I'll open up my Dialpad. This is now in a progressive web app, which means it runs on my Chrome box. And uh, I can just log in with my Google email address because it's all connected to my Google ecosystem. Um, and it's going to automatically open up my phone here. So let me zoom in so you can see that a little bit better. So here is my dial pad. Um, and my dial pad actually gives me uh, not only access to our office main line, which is our, our main company line that everyone has access to, but I also get a direct number uh, that I can dial in and out from. So if someone wants to call my direct number, um, then they can actually call through to that number. Um, don't bother calling that if you're, on, if you're on the live stream. I probably won't answer unless I know who's calling. Um, anyway, but what Dialpad gives me is um, something very, very cool. You know, apart from all the basics, like I can see that my executive assistant, Gypsy, has just started a phone call here. I can see who's available today. I can see who's unavailable at the moment. Uh, but when I go to the main line for our company, uh, let's go and have a look here at all the calls that are coming into our main line. Uh, I can actually see who has made calls into our company. I can see who has actually answered those calls. I can see how long the duration of the call was. I could even potentially open up and see if there's a transcript. Doesn't look like there's a transcript for that uh, particular call. Um, but yeah, it basically brings up um, absolutely everything in one place so I can see right across the whole company. Now, not only that, Dialpad also gives you pretty amazing analytics, reports, uh, it's got amazing AI features like the ability to automatically have your calls transcribed uh, and it can take action items and bullets from your calls. A number of amazing features that you don't get with Google Voice and you don't get with any other tools. Uh, it's really, really a fantastic piece of software. And it was actually built by ex-Googlers. Um, and so uh, there was a product called Grand Central that was bought by Google and became Google Voice. And so the guys that created Google Voice then left Google and created Dialpad because they wanted to create a business phone solution and they thought they could do a better job than Google. Google Voice was taking way too long to be released. It has now been released, uh, but feature for feature, Dialpad's got a lot more business and enterprise features than Google Voice does. Uh, and price-wise, they're, they're pretty much at parity. So um, make sure you consider Dialpad. Uh, if you're interested, there are other tools out there. Uh, there's 8x8, there's Ring Central, um, but we love Dialpad. We've implemented it in hundreds of companies and, uh, and it goes very, very well. The other cool thing about Dialpad is if you have an international team, like let's say maybe you've got a team uh, in the Philippines that you're building out for customer service, they can actually call using local country numbers for the country that you operate your business in. So we primarily operate inside Australia. And so the majority of our customers are in Australia. And so our team, even though based in the Philippines, when they're calling our Australian customers, will actually have Australian phone numbers dialing to our customers. 
We also have our sales team who are working with our US-based customers, dialing out from US-based numbers. So it doesn't look like some weird number showing up on someone's phone when you're calling your customers. But the cool thing is, is that you could be on the beach using Dialpad and dialing your customers from another country and they think you are in their state or in their city based on the numbers that we issue for your Dialpad account. All you need is a Wi-Fi connection or you can even use a, the pretty awesome app on your mobile phone to get work done. And one of the interesting things about Dialpad and to an extent, some of these other uh, you know, cloud-based phone systems is it was actually designed mobile first. So the, the, the primary reason that it was uh, designed or the, the, the primary interface it was designed for is actually to work on a mobile rather than working on a desktop. And a lot of legacy, uh, uh, you know, um, PABX is the technical term, but the VoIP systems, you know, voice over IP systems have to run on an app on a computer. And a lot of the mobile phone apps are absolute trash. They're really, really hard to use. They drop out, uh, you know, the, the quality is poor, but Dialpad have done a phenomenal job on the mobile experience. Also, if you think about, if you have your phone just on your computer, let's say you're on the other side of the office and the phone rings, you've got to run back to your computer, you've got to unlock it, you've got to put on your headset, and then you've got to answer the call. It can be a little bit of a mess, whereas your phone is always in your pocket. And even though you're using the app on your mobile phone, and you might be down the street, uh, you are still using your business phone line. So your customer just sees a business phone line that they're calling. Very, very cool, uh, especially around this time for Christmas. Uh, if you are coming up to a holiday period for your business, you may be interested to implement something like Dialpad, particularly if you have the kind of business that people come to to do business with you. Uh, we had a customer who, uh, I can't remember their business, I, I think it was some kind of like um, heavy machinery or manufacturing, and customers would come to their location to get service. Uh, but while they were over their Christmas break, which was two to three weeks, uh, they obviously didn't have anyone at the office or at their warehouse location to answer calls. And so we rerouted their phone numbers into Dialpad. And so their business became basically a virtual phone system inside Dialpad. And they were able to still take calls over the holidays. Now, they closed an additional $10,000 of business over the Christmas period just because they answered the phone. And think about it, all of your competitors are probably not answering the phone over Christmas, but you could have one or two staff designated to take calls or at least respond to voicemails over that period for anyone who does happen to call your business. And that's going to put you well, well ahead of anyone who is just literally not answering calls and not getting back to any potential inquiries. So food for thought around this time of year, if you've got holidays coming up, uh, our recommendation is Dialpad. If you're interested in that, jump on the link down below this video and uh, book in an inquiry with our team. There's also a Dialpad page on our website, which has heaps of videos and more information on the product. Okay, uh, so moving on to our next one. Great question, thank you for, uh, thank you for asking. I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna take a little break, a little break and a drink here, guys. It's been going an hour. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Drop me a little chat down there if you're enjoying this. If this is useful, please let me know. I'm going to um, I'm gonna go for as long as I have energy for today. I've got about, I think about 20 questions picked out from the team. So we're gonna do as many as possible. And if you have live questions as well, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna cover those as well. So uh, <clears throat> sorry, Christina has asked. I think I'm still confused. I have two domains. Uh, do I have to pay to be a user on both domains or can I view, manage, and utilize all workspace apps in both domains with one user ID? Okay, so this is an interesting question, Christina. I'm not sure if I'm 100% uh, on the right track with your question, but I think what Katrina is asking here is how to manage uh, users with multiple domain names under one workspace account. And we've done a number of videos on our account on managing multiple domain names inside Google Workspace. Uh, and so if you're running you know, multiple brands, uh, if you have multiple businesses, uh, you want to be considering using them under one Google Workspace account if you've got the same team managing those brands. Um, you know, but then comes the issue of, well, how do I manage the billing and what does that actually look like? So um, I'm gonna show you this on my uh, little Jamboard app here. And let's say we have uh, one Google Workspace account. So I'm going to, uh, oops, that's probably not helpful. Let's make one Google Workspace account, right? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll just call that something like my Workspace account, right? And under one Workspace account, you can actually have multiple Domain names, and we kind of know that, right? So let's say I've got itgenius.com, right? 
And uh, let's say I've also got itgenius.com.au. That's pretty popular. Some business owners will want to, uh, you know, have multiple domains for multiple markets that they uh, that they work in. Um, and let's say maybe I've got a, uh, you know, like a, a side project or a second company here. So I'll say OSH. Our second company is uh, called Onsite Helper. Um, they're not actually in our workspace account, but for the purposes of this, we will uh, we will use this. Okay, so we have one workspace account and uh, and we have three domains in here, right? We have three different domain names available. Now, under these domains, what you then have is your buckets of email. And your buckets of email are the actual users, right? So you have, you know, you've got Pete here, you've got Bob there, and you've got, Sarah there, okay? So you've got three buckets of email with different people. Now, these email addresses can be configured for multiple people using either add-on domains or alias domains. And I've got other videos on covering the difference between add-on domains and alias domains. But let's make it really simple here. Let's say, for example, uh, Pete wants to have uh, Pete at itg.com here. And he also needs itg.com.au. And maybe Bob needs itg.com.au and also needs osh.com. And maybe Sarah needs just osh.com. Now, you only pay per bucket of email. That's all you actually pay for. So when I go to my buckets here, I pay one user for Pete, I pay one user for Bob, and I pay one user for Sarah, irrespective of how many domain names or email addresses we have there. So the easiest way to work out how much you're gonna need to pay is to work out, okay, this is gonna be roughly equivalent to the number of humans that you have in the business is what you're going to need to pay. Now, from time to time, you may say, well, you know what? Um, I need Sarah to have a completely separate bucket of email just dedicated for just dedicated for itg.com. Because if you're using multiple, there are some limitations. Bob here has to choose one as his primary. And let's say he makes IT Genius his primary. His calendar invitations will go from ITG. He can't send a calendar invitation from OSH. He can send an email from OSH, but he can't send a calendar invitation from OSH. Bit of a bummer, right? Uh, the other thing he can't do is he can't um, uh, accept a Google Drive uh, folder share or a document share from OSH. It's the same account. I mean, someone can send one to him, but when he accepts it, it's going to show as ITG. And so if these are very different brands, let's say Sarah's working across two different brands and they're like completely different industries, right? One's dog food and one's chemicals or defense. <laughs> Probably wouldn't want to mix those two up, right? Dog food and chemicals. Um, you would potentially consider making them completely separate. Now, I would ask, if, you, if you've got two completely separate businesses, well, is it really appropriate to have them both in one Google Workspace account? You know, might it make more sense to instead move this Google Workspace account over to, uh, over to the side here, right? And then set up a secondary Google Workspace account and then maybe say, well, this, you know, this business here is completely separate I'm going to put that domain there and then, you know, yes, you know, it's going to cost us some extra licenses, but would have worked out the same anyway. Um, and in that case, that keeps things completely separate, keeps your billing completely separate because you've now got, you know, your workspace account number two, which is going to have its own billing there. Um, and they're, they're just going to be completely separated and different. But what do we do with, we've got a little problem here. What do we do with this account here, Bob? Bob needs an OSH email. And all of a sudden we've got these in two accounts. And there's a little bit of a uh, there's a little bit of a, a wall here, right? Chinese wall, 
between these two accounts. They're no longer connected. You, if if osh.com is on the right-hand side here, uh, we can actually no longer add that as a domain name under our primary workspace account on the left. But what we can do is we can actually set up a uh, we can actually set up a forward. So we can actually forward. So we create Bob. We create Bob here. Uh, you could create Bob as like a bucket of email if you wanted to. Uh, but I believe that we can actually forward that using routing rules. We can, yeah, there are ways. I just thought of how to do that. I won't get too complicated for you guys, but we can route that. Uh, what you would do is you create Bob as like an alias uh, of another mailbox, and then you just, you just forward it there. And then Bob here can also be authorized to send with that email address as well. So Bob can still use Bob at OSH, um, and he's going to be sending and receiving through that secondary domain. So I've got really complicated there, but I'm sure this will be interesting to some people who are managing multiple companies and multiple domains. Uh, that's how you do it. That gives you a little bit of a rundown on how you might structure your different Google accounts. As with everything on our channel, if this is getting to the stage of being a bit too technical or you'd like some handholding, or you just want to speak to someone in plain business terms or draw this out yourself, and have a tech person do the implementation and actually just do it for you, uh, then jump on the link down below this video, have a chat to our team, jump on a concierge, and this is the kind of thing that we can help you with, including if you've got two accounts in one and you need to split them out and migrate the data, or if you've got two separate accounts and you want to consolidate them into a single account uh, and you want to uh, you know, merge that data into one place, you want to make sure that happens without any downtime, emails going missing, making sure that DNS records are correct and all those things. Um, we've done this many, many, many times. Literally, I'd say over a thousand implementations of Google Workspace now across different companies. Um, we'd be very happy to help out with that if you need some help. Okay, but great question. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> all right. Yeah, good question, DJ. So this is a follow-up question to uh, Dialpad, and DJ has suggested you could technically use Google Fi data-only SIM uh, with the Dialpad app using a Google uh, using a Pixel for a business line, and that's absolutely correct. When I travel overseas, I actually just use Dialpad on my phone, and what I do is I forward my mobile number to my Dialpad business line. So if someone was to attempt to call my mobile number, it actually just goes straight through to my Dialpad app, and then I can answer my business calls from the Dialpad app. The other cool thing that Dialpad does is if a message goes through to voicemail, it transcribes the voicemails for me, which is very handy. Um, and so, yes, if you're using your business line on your mobile phone, you technically don't need a mobile phone uh, a SIM plan for calls. You would only need data. However, with Dialpad, it has a pretty groovy feature in that when you go to make a phone call from your mobile phone, you've got two options to make that call. You can either call using data, which is the standard way that a VoIP call would be made, or the second option is you can call using a carrier call. And you call a special number, and it will actually mask your phone number and make it look like your business line is dialing out when Dialpad calls your customer. And this is how uh, companies like Uber will have uh, you know, their driver call you. The driver is actually calling their uh, head office and the head office is rerouting the call so it looks like it's coming from Uber's customer service and not actually the mobile phone of your Uber driver. So that same technology is built into Dialpad and that means that if you wanna run everything on data, you can, but if you wanna also use a cellular call to call your customer, from your mobile and make it look like your business line is calling them, that happens right inside a Dialpad. Amazing feature, very clever, awesome implementation and available on all Dialpad plans. All right, uh, KevDog, thank you for joining. Great to have you here. If you have any questions, uh, you can drop them um, straight down in the chat. Okay. Uh, Take Adkins has asked, we've recently started using Google Drive as our client portal. Uh, any thoughts on a good way to direct clients to just their specific drive or folder uh, from a single login page? We really want to have a login button on our website's homepage where all clients can use at any time to access their resources uh, instead of having to go back through emails to find a direct link. Well, I've got a non-Google solution to this that kind of came to mind when I saw this question. And my 
non-Google solution would be to set up a redirect for your URL uh, for your website using a plugin like Pretty Links. And if you haven't heard of Pretty Links, uh, that's basically how you can create a branded uh, shortened link. It's a little bit like uh, using something like Bitly, uh, but this actually runs on your WordPress website. And I thoroughly recommend this tool. We use it for all of our sites, um, but it's a plugin that you buy once. Um, and then from there, it runs on your site and you can make as many links as you want. You are no longer limited to your plan on Bitly uh, or anything else. And because it all runs on your website, it means that you get access to all of the analytics on these links uh, using Google Analytics, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so we use that for things like, if you go to our website, itgenius.com forward slash links, uh, it's automatically going to redirect you to our links page. Uh, it, actually, that one didn't redirect. Okay, maybe we'll do another one, itgenius.com, maybe let's say forward slash quick dash fix. That's gonna automatically redirect you to the quick fix page, uh, which is actually a sub page of products. Um, and so for this particular person who was interested in redirecting a client straight to their Google folder, I would say you could do, uh, you know, yourcompanyname.com forward slash client name. And then you can just give them that link to remember. Uh, and then they're going to remember their name or they're going to re remember their business name. Um, and maybe you could set that up once when you onboard the customer as part of your onboarding practice. And then once you've onboarded the customer, then they've got that URL made up. Now, you want to be very, very careful that you don't uh, you know, mess up the, uh, the permissions or anything like that, um, because effectively you're, you know, you're exposing a bit of a security risk there that if someone knows what your, other, what, what your other customer's name is, they can go to the URL and attempt to open the drive. But as long as you're very careful with your Google Drive permissions, there's no issue with someone getting access to a Google Drive link URL uh, as long as you've got the permissions locked down because only the people who are designated inside that Google shared drive will be able to get access to it. Uh, but hopefully that helps uh, to make things easier for you. The other thing would just be kind of training of your uh, of your customers. If they know that they can go to Google Drive, they can open the shared with me menu inside Google Drive. When they go to shared with me, they're automatically going to be shown anything that is shared with them. And they could even you know right click on one of those files and from there, they could uh, add it to the start menu and adding it to the start menu is gonna have it show up in start so they can always access it there. You can now create uh, links, they're called uh, shortcuts. There we go, add a shortcut to drive. And what that will do is that will allow you to create a shortcut in a My Drive. So maybe your customer decides to create a shortcut to that shared folder or shared drive inside their My Drive. So anytime they open up drive, they can easily access it. That might make it easier than them having to re-go back and hunt through their emails every time. I hope that was helpful. Okay, uh, I'm going to I'm going to adjust my desk now. I'm going to switch to standing up mode, uh, just so that I can uh, get my get my energy going a bit better. All right, wonderful. Love a good standing desk, especially a motorized one. For a long time, I had a standing desk, and it was just it was just permanently standing up. And so, what I had to do was I had to uh, you know work as long as I could work, and then I'd have to go and have a sit down for the afternoon uh, every time I was done. Uh, G'day, Ali! Thanks so much for joining the live. Great to have you here. Uh, great to have you listening in as always. Ali is one of our top stream watchers, uh, one of our uh, one of our number one super fans. So, thank you for joining, Ali. I'm going to have to like send you a T-shirt or something like that. Uh, we'll have to get those uh, organized. We're working on our fan swag. If there's anything, if you want t-shirts or mugs or anything like that, let me know, and uh, and we'll we'll uh, start getting some sent out. All right, wonderful. We've got a few more questions left. Uh, we're going to try and get through all of these. Next question we have is from Bebek. Can Workspace Admin see what devices I am logged into? Uh, yes. The short answer is yes. They absolutely can. Um, every time a device logs into a Google Workspace account, uh, it actually appears inside the admin panel. And I'll show you what that looks like inside the admin panel. If you head along to your admin panel, uh, you can actually go to the devices menu. Uh, and inside the devices menu, um, it's going to give you lots of different options here. So you'll see all the mobile devices. Um, endpoints are going to be things like computers. Uh, oops, I think I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. Um, so I'm in my, let's try that again. 
you go to your admin panel and you click onto the devices menu, you go to overview, and it's gonna show you uh, lots of different devices and where they are accessing from. For example, if I choose to open up my mobile devices menu here, uh, you can see here it actually shows uh, every mobile device that has connected to your account. Uh, if you've got device approval switched on, whether or not the device was actually approved, uh, and it lets you know uh, when it actually last synchronized to the account. Uh, so if I wanna open up an individual device here, uh, it's actually gonna show you like device IDs, serial numbers, those kind of things. Um, gives me lots and lots of information there, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, hopefully that didn't expose their mobile number. No, I think we're good, but uh, we may go back and block that information anyway for security purposes. Um, but from there, um, basically your admin is able to see everything that's going on on your mobile device, anything that's going on with computers. Um, effectively, if you're connecting to a work account, using your Google Workspace account, uh, an administrator is gonna be able to see it. They're also gonna see a log. Um, there is a full log of everyone's actions inside Google Workspace. So each login, each file that you download, um, any files that you move or change, and of course, all of the actual individual data like chat messages, emails, files, all of that is stored inside Google Workspace and your admins have access to all of that. So expect that anything that you are doing inside a Google Workspace account is gonna be accessible by administrators, um, including access and reporting of that access as well. All right, great, wonderful, uh, cool. Allie wants, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't, I don't know if we can do cat-sized T-shirts, maybe like a, a double XL or a triple X, oh, uh, extra small, double X, extra small, or triple extra small, let's see. Okay, so Karina asks, the email address that I use for creating a group in the admin console, uh, does this email address count towards a user and will I be billed or is this treated like an alias and not billable? Uh, we actually covered this one earlier, but that's okay. It's treated like an alias and it's not billable. So any email addresses that you use for groups in the admin console uh, are non-billable, non-billable, they don't count. Uh, it's just treated like an alias, which means you don't pay for anything. Festina asks, uh, in Germany, we're required to store employee details for five years and we have suspended users who have left the company. Can I use Google Vault for this? Uh, when their drive data is stored in Vault, can I use license uh, for another user? Great question. Um, unfortunately, with Google Vault, uh, you need to maintain uh, Google Vault for each user that you wanna keep data for, for the archived users, uh, so that you don't lose access to that data. Um, secondly, when you have a uh, when you have a setup here, and you have uh, let's say you have um, you know number of suspended users sitting inside your account, while they remain suspended, you're still paying for those licenses as well. So suspended users cost you money. Now Google have a solution for this. They've they've created an archived user SKU, um, and that archived user basically lets you pay a couple of dollars a month and keep a suspended user active uh, in an archived state but it's not my recommendation that you do that. Particularly in small and micro businesses, staff tend to turn over, um, you know, like you may have an average of, you know, once a year, a staff member will turn over. Maybe if you're lucky, it's less than that. Um, you know, maybe you can get it down to like 30% per year or 20% per year even. And so people are turning over, you know, two or three or five years at a time. Uh, but inevitably, you're gonna end up with team members who have left the company and you've got data left over for them. Now, Google gives you a great tool that when you delete a user, you can migrate their drive data and you can automatically also migrate their calendar data and events, uh, you know, things like their, I don't think it moves their chats. I think it's just uh, uh, drive data, calendar data and anything else they own like Google Sites, right? But that doesn't move their email data, unfortunately. There is a migration tool in the admin panel which will help you migrate their data, but we don't recommend using that uh, because we've had problems with it in the past. And you know, we obviously do migrations at scale, and so our team are doing hundreds and hundreds of migrations every month. Um, and we have had trouble with the inbuilt tools inside Google Workspace. We happen to use third-party tools for that, uh, and this is where I give you a little pitch for Concierge. Our team will actually do this for you under our Concierge program. And so if you're signed up to Concierge and you have someone leave the business, our best practice recommendation is to migrate their data into a central single archive account. So you only pay for one license for all of your past employees, uh, and then you just monitor and manage your past data from there. So let me show you what that looks like 
inside my admin panel. So I'm gonna to go to my directory here and I'm gonna to go to my users and I'm gonna show you our archive user. So we've got lots of users uh, here in our admin panel and you can see the uh, IT Genius archive account has, uh, has 48 gigabytes of storage used in there. That is quite a lot of data. And uh, the other little trick that we do is we access that account via delegated mail. And so if I wanna get access to any of the emails in there, that mailbox has been delegated access back to my account. And we've got other videos on our channel on how to access delegated mailboxes to, uh, to check out how to set that up. But when I click on my own Google account, um, you'll see here in the list of emails that pops up when it does finally pop up. Oh, something went wrong. That's bizarre, isn't it? Okay, maybe let's try another another refresh and see if I can get it to work again. The rule rule number one of demos is uh, that everything always breaks. <laughs> uh, okay, let's try again. All right, this must not be playing ball today. Hopefully I can still access, and I cannot access my delegated accounts. Okay, uh, you'll have to imagine that, but in a delegated account, we would normally have a list of accounts here. Uh, one of those being my, uh, uh, my archive account, and then I can access and search. And so basically that archive account becomes the dumping ground for all of your past users' data. Uh, so you dump all of those past users' data into, the, into that account. Um, anytime you delete a user, you move all their Google Docs and everything into that account. And that means that the, no data is ever gonna be deleted. And it only costs you one account to do that, uh, and if you're a concierge member, then our team will be able to do that migration for you. And so if you're a concierge member, you just basically send in a request to our team. Maybe it's Friday afternoon and you say, hey, this employee is finishing up today. I'd like their mailbox to be archived and I'd like the offboarding process to be followed. Our team will immediately suspend the account, we'll change the password, we'll log them out of any devices that they're logged in on, we'll migrate their data into the archive account, um, and then eventually we'll delete the account and free up the license. And at that point, you can either reduce the number of licenses that you're using per month, save you some money, or if you have another staff person coming in to replace them, you would issue an account to that extra staff person. And that's basically our magic offboarding process. Many businesses take advantage of that, particularly if you've got you know casuals or staff turning over quite quickly. Um, it's just a message away to our concierge team to get the offboarding process done. Super, super simple and convenient. If you're interested in that, jump on the link down below this video and our team will be very happy to help you out. For many businesses who work with us, they've got a bunch of old email addresses that they're just holding onto, still paying for the licenses for because they're too scared to delete them because you have either a compliance need or just a business need to keep access to that past data. All right, cool. Uh, let me see what we've got here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to merge people into a single account, uh, Kev has said uh, this is useful for if you have a lot of important data. Uh, yes, Graham. And the other thing that our team will do is, is as the migration process happens, you get a you get a label for each person's archived email. However, um, it's pretty easy to find the data. Like once you've got all of that data inside the archived account you can use the advanced search feature inside the archive account to find pretty much email, uh, any email that's there. So you can use the from and to operators in search to find any historical email from any one of your users. Um, so that makes, it, that makes it pretty simple. Okay, let's move on to our next one. So Sunny asks, could you use Google Workspace to create an order intake process? Uh, could you share a product catalog with a B2B buyer uh, and have them fill out an order form? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, you can absolutely create basic and rudimentary business processes inside of Google Workspace. I probably wouldn't use it for a very sophisticated multi-stage project like you know constructing a house where you have task dependencies and you need timelines and due dates and those kind of things. Although I have seen Google promote those kind of projects being run inside a spreadsheet uh, using the new timeline feature and using tick boxes and due dates as drop downs and those kind of things. Um, if you've got a sophisticated workflow or project that you need to deliver, um, then I'd recommend using something like Asana, Monday.com, Trello, Podio, Rike, uh, one of those task management apps which are quite popular 
for delivering tasks and projects. However, if you are interested in a basic order intake process, like for example, a customer submitting an order, you could potentially do that with a Google Form. One of the great things about Google Forms is they allow you to gather structured data and all of that data ends up arriving into a Google spreadsheet. And so for something like orders coming through from customers, it means that you can make sure you have the data formatted in the way that you would like to have it formatted. And once it's formatted in that way, because you're extracting clean data into a spreadsheet, it means that you can create reports, you can create dashboards, uh, and you can actually track the performance of your team and track the performance of your customers and customer inquiries uh, based on that clean data that arrives into the spreadsheet. So very, very useful to use that. Now, um, the second part of your question, uh, creating a product catalog that you share with your customers, Google Sheets is phenomenal for something like that. Uh, if you wanna create a customer price list, and make sure that your customer always has the latest version of their price list for you. Uh, then you would put that on a Google Sheet and then you would just update the Google Sheet anytime you have a pricing update. And what that does is it gives the customer the ability to just have one link saved in their bookmarks and maybe you wanna be kind and create a pretty link on your website so you can have you know, forward slash price list uh, and that will you know give them something that's easy to remember. Um, but with that link to that spreadsheet that you keep updated, your customers don't have to continually check their emails for price lists over and over again. And, oh, do you have last what month's one? No, I've got this month's one. Is it the right, uh, is it the right list? Are they up to date? Uh, you remove all of that by just giving a customer one document. Now, of course, you could do this with a Google Slides presentation. You could do this with a Google Doc as well um, if you wanted to use a document format for that. Uh, but probably the most appropriate for a product catalog or price list would be something like a Google Sheet. Hopefully that is useful for you. Uh, but no, I love using Google for basic uh, for basic workflows. There are other tools like AppSheet, which allows you to build basic custom apps for your business. That starts getting a bit more technical and not always in the best interest of an entrepreneur or business owner to be spending time hard coding apps yourselves. Um, but that is another option there that is in the Google ecosystem. Cool, all right, uh, wonderful. Uh, Kev Dog, thank you for joining. Uh, wonderful. Take care. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining. Cool. Okay. So, next uh, question. Uh, this is actually my final question that I have on the list. So, if you have any other questions that you'd like me to cover, uh, please drop them into the chat. This will be a last chance. Uh, otherwise, I will be wrapping up very shortly. Got through them quickly this time. That's pretty good. Question here from Thomas Are there any cost savings in merging? currently separated domains into one account with an add-on structure. For example, I have three domains with two users on all and uh, one unique on each. So three different domain names and two users uh, have, okay, all right, I'm gonna have to draw this. <laughs> I'm gonna have to draw this. All right, let's open this up. So let me open up a little fresh, fresh page here. Gonna go back to my email buckets as I love to do. Okay, so we have, a number of users, we have a number of domains. So we have domain1.com, we have domain2.com, and we have domain3.com, oops. Great, okay, cool. So we've got that there, and let's say we've got emails from domain one going into multiple buckets, Domain two, I think, so it was going to multiple buckets and domain three was going there. Now, the question here is, should all of these stay in one single Google Workspace account? Or should these be broken up into multiple Google Workspace accounts? That's the age old question of Google Workspace. Now, my simple rule for this is, if you're a small to micro sized business and you have potentially multiple domains or multiple brands, if you have the same set of staff working across multiple brands and they're managing those different email addresses and that's fine, then it might make sense to keep everything consolidated because basically you're only gonna be paying for each bucket of email. Each bucket of email is what's going to cost you money. You are irrespective of the domains uh, at the top or the workspace accounts at the top, you're just gonna be paying for the buckets of email that live down the bottom here. Okay, cool, so we've established that. 
The reasons why you may split out domains into multiple accounts, very strong reasons for that would be if you have different business partners in some of those domains or businesses, um, if they're wildly different to each other. So in another uh, section, I gave the example of like a dog food company versus a chemical waste company. Probably don't want to accidentally mix up those two. Um, number three, there are some technical limitations to having both domains under one account, like you can only send calendar invites from the primary domain of each user. So if you need to keep the brands very, very, very separate, you may choose to have them separately. Um, or number four is if you see at some point in the future, one of the businesses growing so much that there may be an exit or different business partners or different shareholders or different investors, and you want to keep them separate. It is possible to consolidate different accounts and bring them into one. And it's also possible to split out accounts, take a consolidated account and split it out into multiple accounts. But it gets exponentially more complicated and more expensive the larger your organization gets. Now, we happen to specialize in this and we've had public companies in Australia come to us and have us move hundreds or thousands of mailboxes out from accounts when they're going through a split or a demerger or they're changing their corporate structure. And then we've ha it had mid-sized companies even who have had one brand that's just had multiple sub-brands, but each sub-brand has become its own separate company. And so they had 250 odd users and they had to separate those. And then we have small micro businesses where we have an entrepreneur who has multiple brands or multiple domain names, and they just wanna consolidate and simplify everything and bring it into one place. And we're able to migrate domain names and information from separate accounts and bring it into one. It's kind of up to you um, how you do it. Remember that you can always move them out later if you wanna keep things simple for now. And maybe you've got a side hustle and you know it's not really that all that serious to create a separate account for it right now. You'd prefer to have everything in one place. That's absolutely fine to run them under one account. Just remember to budget for at some point in the future, potentially needing to split out or change those accounts. And you may be up for a small migration fee as a part of that in the future. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much for joining. I don't have any other questions to cover here. So I want to say, uh, yeah, a big thank you for joining. Wonderful to uh, have you here as, uh, as part of the, uh, as part of the program, as part of the lives, please make sure you're subscribed. Give me a thumbs up if you like this content. Uh, if you're watching the repeat hashtag repeat, uh, drop that down in the comments and I uh, would love to know where you're watching from. Uh, what would you like to see coming up in an upcoming video? I'm answering these questions literally from the channel. So if you ask a question on the channel, um, please make sure that, uh, yeah, that you drop it into there and I will as much as possible help uh, record any answers to your questions that I can get to. I'm trying to get to all of them uh, that are relevant to everyone and, uh, and I look forward to catching you on the next one. All right, take care.